the galaxy writhes like a wounded beast. Tormented by the infected sores of countless warp storms, it laments in agony. While the forces of the Imperium Sanctus fight tooth and nail to regain control, the worlds of the Imperium Nihilus endure besiegement by nightmares uncounted. The forces of chaos attack on every front, from the Nachmund Gauntlet to the Caradon Sector. Alien races battle furiously for survival or rampage across the stars in orgies of conquest and destruction. Yet no one faction can truly gain mastery. Every victory and defeat only sees the Inferno rage hotter. Abaddon the Despoiler has not labored for thousands of years to see his long war end in mutual annihilation. His hands move unseen through the shadows on secret and diabolical missions. His legions of sorcerers and cryptomagi pour over every shred of arcane lore and prophetic utterance ever gathered, hunting for some esoteric advantage that would allow the War Master to seize decisive control of the conflict. Abaddon desires a secret weapon to unleash upon the Imperium of Man, and he will tear apart time and space if he must, to secure it. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and events of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. After a long break due to fatigue, I come back to you now at the turning of the ages. For the new narrative campaign will be, as stated by Wade himself, as important and groundbreaking as the rising storm. And he was not kidding. For we stand on the footstep of doom to all that we know. The setting itself is about to move forward via the medium of the Arcs of Omens. For good or evil, better or worse, we shall enjoy this moment together as one community. Today we open the festivities with the entry for Abaddon. The format many will be familiar with, but it shall be extracts from the book, then my own thoughts and commentary, then more clarification, then on to the next subject entry. And so, welcome to Warhammer in 2023, and welcome to the guides. Now a brief word about something before we get to the crux of the matter, but I think you'll like this. I did so much that I waived any fee. Let's get into it. I'm Lockie from Zorpazorp, and I love wargaming, but sometimes it's just so hard to find a game. Are there players near me, events, tournaments? I just want some nice folks to roll dice with. Well, all of that pain is about to go away with the coolest wargaming innovation I've ever seen. It's time to meet Voxlink. Voxlink is the ultimate tabletop gaming community app. With the Game Finder, you can easily find new opponents to have unforgettable game nights with, no more posting on awful social media pages and screaming into the void. Voxlink connects you to nearby players playing your games, tournaments, and events across your community, and even has a built-in message board system so you can post memes without having to explain to grandma who the god emperor is. Local game stores can publish and host events, as well as gaining access to a suite of community building tools, and individual players can announce to the world the systems and armies they play, and the types of games they're looking for. Voxlink is going to be massive. Hopefully it will change the way that wargamers connect forever, but we need your help to make the dream a reality. Come and join the Voxlink family early over on Kickstarter, so we can get this baby off to a flying start. 
start. There will be a free version of the app so we can suit everyone's budgets and include the whole community, but with bonus features for premium users and our beloved beta testers, as well as verified accounts for retailers and local gaming shops, we're hoping to make connecting to your gaming community easier than ever before. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote. In my dreams, the sky is burning. The stars blaze bright enough to drown out the darkness around. My heart leaps to see their lights, and I weep to feel such hope. Then the stars begin to die, faltering, guttering. One by one they burn away and crumble to ash that falls thick as snow. It lands upon my upturned face. It mingles with my tears. My hope has turned to horror. And as I drag my fingers down my cheeks, they trail smears of darkness that scald my skin. I sink to my knees amidst the ashes. I know that this is the end of me, of everything. Yet in that moment, I am seized by sudden knowledge, revelation. I can stop this. I tear my gaze from the dying heavens, and I dig, terrified that I may already be too late. Something lies under the ashes. Something has been hidden deep. Something with the power to stop the stars from burning out. My clawed fingers uncover a pattern in the ashes, I see the suggestion of furnaces and screaming mouths, of chains of hammers. At their heart stands a figure with eyes of burning cinder. It turns. Terror grips me, and I dig. There's another pattern sitting below the first, a fortress vast and mighty, but gouged by the beasts raging about its walls. Again, the cinders dance before my eyes, racing across the ashen bastion like cracks, just before the image shatters. Those glowing lines of cinders form the shape of a crimson giant. Above me, the skies die, and die, and die. I dig. I see an ashen forest grow, and wither and grow again. I see an ancient knight kneeling upon his field of victory and weep cinder tears. I see a circle within a circle within a circle, inward and inward until at their heart, nothing. The light grows faint and still I dig. I cannot be too late. And then, at last, I have it. The key is an ugly thing of brass and bone and rock. Its rusted surface is hot, burns my bleeding fingers. I cannot care. I must end this. But a key must have a lock. Even as the dream begins to fade, I feel my gaze dragged back to the hollow skies above. I do not want to look. But I must. So few stars remain. And as they swirl together, they become a single searing point so bright it hurts my eyes. I know that I have found the keyhole. Yet even as my shaking hand raises the key on high, I am gripped by a different fear. What has been imprisoned? What will I unleash? My doubts redouble, and I feel suddenly as though I am being used. But now the dream has me, and I cannot resist. 
The key slides into a lock that blazes with the light of dying stars. It turns and flames engulf me. I wake screaming, nails torn from swollen fingers, bloody tears streaking my face. Sometimes, if I am lucky, it is days before I dream again. But I always dream again. End quote. Concerning Ezekiel Abaddon. The despoiler. He comes. From the darkest depths of the past, he comes. The thrice-born. The Lord of the Justarian. The War Master. Abaddon. The name that strikes fear into the hearts of all who know of it. Not just mortal, but never born alike. For in all of reality, there are few things as vicious or spiteful as the Despoiler. His rage is cold as ice, white hot as the center of a star. He is the most terrible thing to have come from the Horus Heresy. But to understand the danger of Abaddon is only possible when put into context. So let us truly begin. Abaddon. Born in the years of splendor, the end of old night, the rise of the Imperium, Ezekiel Abaddon was raised on Chthonia, his father a mighty warlord of the gangs, some said the most powerful. Yet the quandary of Abaddon was alive even then, for the coming of age right of his people meant that he, Abaddon, should kill his own friends. When tasked with this, he flat refused. Ezekiel would not do it. Some would consider this weakness, yet it was not. For Abaddon then challenged and slew his own father, his first act of patricide. Yet he was banished, found by the Lunar Wolves later, and brought into the legions as an Astartes, a space marine. When the gene seed was placed within him, he changed, as all marines do. The Lunar Wolves were one of the legions where the seed could make the Astartes look more like their Primarch. Ezekiel Abaddon was one such marine. Yet he towered over many of his peers, and he rose quickly. He was a natural-born killer. He became the right hand of the Primarch, Horus Lupercal, and was the captain of his first, the veteran Justarians, the Terminators. He was also a member of the Mornival, the four officers from the Legion that Horus used as his concilium, his advisors, and sometimes his cat's paws. Abaddon was known to be the most effective and brutal warrior in the Legion, and he was not a yes man, not in the slightest. Ezekiel was no lickspittle or toady hanging on the words of his Primarch. All adored Horus, even Abaddon once, but he would be straight even with his gene father. When Horus went over to rebellion, Abaddon was with him right at his shoulder. In some ways, he was further down the path, as he had already been instrumental in the new warrior lodges. Their message, their contempt for the mortals that the Astartes lived and died to free and protect. Baseline humanity. When Davin happened, he stomped humans out of his way to help to save his Primarch. Men he died, and the floodgates were opened. Horus was a dire warning to Abaddon, one that he witnessed up close and personal. Abaddon followed Horus, but saw his weaknesses, his frailties. He saw how Horus was used. For one cannot wield chaos, it only wields you. Or so it was with all of the hyper-beings of the time. Abaddon was always present at the highest levels of meetings. He witnessed each of the traitor Primarchs fall to chaos, and then become parodies of themselves. Fulgrim, Angron, Magnus. During the siege, then later the rest. All bent the knee to chaos, 
and became their tools. Even Horus vaunted to be the most powerful of all the Primarchs. Even Horus could not resist them fully. Horus was wounded, broken, and emotionally and mentally smashed by the conflicting powers of the Chaos Guards. He thought he was using them, their power, to give him a fighting chance against the Emperor. But they had consumed him. He was nothing more than their puppet. And Abaddon was there when they beamed onto the vengeful spirit. He took his Terminator guard and attempted to cut his way to his war master. The Imperial fist in his way he brushed aside, and only then did he find his own father Horus annihilated. His soul utterly stripped from him, the strings cut. He was dead, slain by the Emperor. And the Lord of the Jostarian, Abaddon, snapped. He took the sons of Horus and their fleet, and he retreated from Terra as fast as he could. The siege was broken, the legions then dispersed. Eventually, the vengeful loyalists Rogel Dorn, Lionel Johnson, Corvus Korax, Yagatai Khan, Lehman Ross and Vulcan led their legions against the traitors, slaughtering them until they had escaped into the Eye of Terror. It was then that Abaddon went into self-imposed exile, and in his absence, the legions fell on each other. But what happened to the Primarchs, one might ask? Well, most of them were elevated to demon Primarch status, and this is the confusing thing. For most would just see this as an augmentation of their power, a level up, so to put it. But that is simply not the entirety of it all. When each of the Primarchs have turned to a Chaos Patron and changed, their entire position in the universe is also altered. For they are now more of the warp than of real space. And their might is augmented indeed, but their substance and perception are mutated. For they are now some of the greatest weapons of the Dark Gods, even those who are Chaos Undivided. And as such, they are far more important than real space. Many forget that the real world, the Materium, is a shadow to the Warp, even to the great gods of Chaos. Their main preoccupation is, and always must be, the great game. The war within the Warp between these great powers. The Demon Primarchs are only now returning, but that we shall get into in due course. The fact remains that during the period of the Scouring, and then the Legion or Slave Wars, the Primarchs were tantamount to gone. They were sort of incubating, in some cases, or outright involved immediately in the Great Game, and the Slaves that they had taken into the Eye of Terror were not enough. Also, the resources the Legions had were now finite in many cases. So the Traitor Legions fell on each other. Centuries of war were performed, the carnage unbelievable. The legions shattered into companies and chapters, then further into war bands around powerful individuals only. The Emperor's children were the most effective and aggressive in this war, and they struck at the very Bastille of the Sons of Horus, stealing the body of the Primarch. The Primogenitor, Fabius Bile, the arch geneticist, now had his hands on the genetic motherload, and he intended to play. And in all this time, many in the traitor hosts became disaffected, from the constant war without cause, without real reason, without victory, with the leadership of their band or legion, with the lack of discipline, of loyalty, of, of camaraderie, a yearning for something more was growing across many of the remaining traitor Astartes. In all of this time, Ezekiel Abaddon was in the desert of the soul. He was exiled. He was changing. Abaddon had left his legion to die. He had also been going through a metamorphosis, for Abaddon was being forged into something greater by far. 
greater than his mortal father, greater even than his immortal Primarch father. Abaddon was beginning to understand, to become the thrice-born, the true war master. But why do I call him that, the thrice-born? For indeed, Ezekiel has been thus. First, he was born as a mortal man, then changed and reborn as an Astartes, and then transformed again while in exile to become the beast that he is now. While in the furthest reaches of the Eye of Terror in the Radiant Worlds, hell holes blasted by the light of the Astronomicon, yet some went to find him. And they were not all even sons of Horus. A disparate group went on this pilgrimage, only to discover that it was Abaddon who had sent for them. He was, after all of the years of contemplation, of metamorphosis. He was ready. Ready to return. Ready to lead. Ready to begin the long war. To quote, We were built for battle, Kaon. We were made to conquer the galaxy, not to rot in hell and die upon our brother's blades. Who were the architects of the Imperium? Who fought to purge its territory of aliens and expand its borders? Who brought rebellious worlds to heal and slaughtered those who refused the light of progress? Who walked from one side of the galaxy to the other, marking their passage in a trail of treacherous dead? This is our Imperium. Built across the worlds we burnt, over bones we broke, with the blood we shed. You see it too. You feel it now, don't you? A new war. Not one born of bitterness, nor founded on revenge. The long war, Kaon. Ezekiel Abaddon to Iskander Kaon, formerly of the Thousand Sons. End quote. Thus did Abaddon bring the damaged, yet still mighty ship, the Vengeful Spirit. And he punished the Emperor's children so badly at Scalathrax, then engagement after engagement, that they began to fracture. He hunted down the Gene Lord Fabius Bile, and when he stormed his keep on Canticle City on the demon world of Harmony, Abaddon was confronted by a perfect clone of his father, Horus Lupercal. The Primarch was not as he should be, despite his perfect size, tone, style, and even some vestigial memories, but he was not Horus. And that day, Ezekiel Abaddon freed himself of any last doubt or pity when he became a fratricide for the second time. He bested the clone of Horus and punched the talons of Horus through his chest. And in that moment, more than any other, the Black Legion was born. For Abaddon had become the answer. He hated the Primarchs for their weakness. He despised the Chaos Gods for twisting and destroying the Legions. What they were, what they stood for. For the Brotherhood, he believed that they epitomized. And he would create a new Legion. The Black Legion. All could join, as long as they swore fealty to Abaddon. All could be brought into the professional, orderly brotherhood that was now emerging. Some resisted, of course. Some attempted to crush the Black Legion before it even truly began. But each and every one of Abaddon's rivals was dispatched so brutally, so effectively, so efficiently, and with such spite that even the Neverborn began to fear Ezekiel. His revenge for faithlessness was so legendary that they feared him. As with each victory, he would smash the head of the serpent that absorbed the body that remained. The Black Legion swelled in size and was indeed a legion once more. Stolen gene seed converts, volunteer warbands. The yearning in the Astartes' heart now had a center. 
Abaddon and his long war. It had purpose. It gave clarity. It was a heady draft to any not yet consumed by debauchery. Abaddon is the pure, refined product. Even before he gained one of the most savage and potent demon weapons in existence, the demon sprung from the very first human murder, the blade containing none other than Draknien, the one demon the Emperor could not banish or destroy. Abaddon is not a puppet of the Dark Gods. He has learnt from the mistakes of his father, and he has learnt the most deadly weapon of all. Self-control. For Abaddon has made pacts and deals with near every force in the Eye of Terror. He has always managed to do this and remain independent. Despite the four Dark Gods' constant game to make him theirs, despite the sorcerers, never-born princes, witches and legionnaires he has dealt with, even going so far as to gaining alliances with each of the demon Primarchs, Abaddon has still walked the line. For ten thousand years he has resisted their control. He has learnt how to wield the powers of chaos as never his sire or the Emperor ever could. They do not wield him. And this is what makes Abaddon so terrifying. For he has no revenge or retribution to take from a father, for he has slain him. He has no need to look in the eyes of the Emperor merely for the satisfaction of knowing he has lost. No. Abaddon does not care about the Emperor, really, merely what he represents. Abaddon is not out for a quick win and a head on a pike on a wall. Abaddon is playing for the entire galaxy. The demon Primarchs have attempted to strike a terror and the Golden Throne again and again. Their myopic grudge against their father is perhaps the only trace of their humanity left alive. Their hate of the Emperor. Yet Abaddon watched what this did to Horus, then the other Primarchs. So he will never fall into this trap. And he does not wish to merely rush headlong to the Soul System, to engage with Reboot Gilliman. He wants it all. Unlike any other, he has the patience and purpose to wait, to slowly by slowly take every last system, star and planet, not just on his way to Terra, but all around that world. He does not want to capsize the Imperium, he wants to replace it. Ezekiel Abaddon is now saturated with dark powers and dark fate, so much that even a blade of an Emperor's champion being shoved through his chest did not kill him. For Sigismund did this to him. Yet Ezekiel is in so many ways still that man who refused to kill his friends. There is a twisted shred of honour still beating in his heart. For he returned the body of Sigismund with all the pomp and pageantry deserving an honoured foe. And only then did he attack. And people have derided Abaddon for taking thirteen attempts to take Cadia, his Black Crusades. They further insulted him by stating the destruction of Cadia was a temper tantrum. How so, I say? How so? For the despoiler knew the world had to be destroyed for his macro plan to succeed, for the gates of heaven to be thrown wide open. He did indeed crash a Blackstone Fortress at the world, yet it did the trick, did it not, and Cadia is gone, and the tear across the galaxy, the Great Rift, has sprung up, exactly as Abaddon had planned. And make no mistake, Ezekiel Abaddon, by doing this, over countless centuries, has shown his ability for the destruction of the Pylons and Cadia itself has changed the universe more than any mortal ever. He, Abaddon, has had more impact on the very nature of the universe than any man alive or dead, even the Emperor. But it is the patience, the tenacity, that is so awe-inspiring. 
and this trait elevates Abaddon to a primary mover in the entire setting. He is now equal to the Emperor or the Silent King, in my mind. Surpassing the likes of any Primarch, Astrobal, Vect, Eldred, or any meagre Necron Lord, he is a spider and a soldier, an honourable foe, a terror, and a tyrant, all in the one. He is the ever-chosen of Chaos, the lord of their armies, because even they, the dark gods of Chaos, have not managed to control him. And now, now he has the Arcs of Omens, and a brand new ally to work with, and a fully armed and operational Gloriana-class battleship. He is unstoppable. But who was this new ally? A new power in the warp, or an old one? Abaddon was contacted by the being known as Vashtor, appearing on Abaddon's ship. The being then flooded it with what seemed like an attack. Tendrils of silvered metal crept from every wall, every control or station. Abaddon strode to the central point of the disruption. There he met the horror. That was Vashtor. Yet, he stayed his hand. Abaddon did not strike this being down. He waited. He showed his new patience. And in so doing, the being fully manifested and then went on to offer Abaddon a pact. An alliance of mutual benefit. And he did so in clear terms, not in riddles or conundrums. And Abaddon said yes. For with Vashtor, he might be able to gain the parts that would make up the key, the key to his destiny. The key to unlock the prophecy and gain power enough to bring down the entire Imperium. And so it began. The Nature of Chaos Gods Now one might be fooled into thinking that there are only four mighty powers in the warp the four dark gods of chaos. Yet these are just the top of the food chain. Yes, they are so mighty that many a cohort of Neverborn are merely extensions of their power. So vast is their might that they can feel entire phalanxes of micro-copies of themselves in demonic form. But never believe that they are all that stalk and crawl in the darkness of the corrupted sea of souls, the warp. For there are a dizzying myriad of beings, demons, vampires, and entities of a broad stripe. Almost anything you can think of has and will exist in the warp, yet far darker, of course. And in the infinite hell that is the warp, there are many, many layers of beings that are neither beholden to, nor act on the behalf of, the great gods of chaos. They are merely the biggest dons in the Delta, so to put it. But every now and again, a new force will rise. Before Slanish and the fall of the Eldar, there were only three gods. Before the birth of the Grandfather, there were two. So there is always the potential for something to create room at the top. Either by exterminating previous powers, as Korn has done, or by simply creating a place at the table, as the Prince of Pleasure did. And so, with that in mind, let us get into the next stage of our journey through this tale. Let us discuss the newest being to attempt to wrestle a seat at the table of ultimate power. Let us discuss Vashtor. To quote, Vashtor the Archiphane, Master of the Soul Forgers, the god in the machine. Vashtor is a demonic demigod of inventors, engineers, scientists, and artisans. He is curiosity and innovation, shorn of moral conscience and driven to its darkest extremes. Empowered by the inquiring of mortal minds, Vashtor embodies the need to understand and then to enslave natural forces and to eventually achieve technological apotheosis at any cost. 
Few mortal savants of any race know of Vashtor the Archifane, for he has manifested only sparingly across the long history of the galaxy. Why this should be is unclear, but it has made him a seldom glimpsed figure of fear, a techno-demonic bogeyman whose occasional appearances always herald nightmarish catastrophe. Some crypto-scholars have claimed that Vashtor was created amidst the reckless arms race of some ancient and galactic spanning war. Others posit that he was birthed into the warp by the horrors of the Dark Age of Technology, or conversely, that he was the author and patron of those horrors. However Vashtor came to be, he is neither a demon prince nor an entity of one of the four Dark Great Gars. He has his own sphere of influence and his own unique role within the wider pantheon of the Warp. He is a master of the Soul Forges. This colossal metaphysical foundry is a realm of dark iron and steam, of clattering cogs and pounding pistons wherein infernal pacts are sworn and grotesque transformations affected. Any demon may approach the essence brokers of the Forges and enter into a pact with them. Some do so, seeing a swift route to martial might, thence into the favor of their patron deity. Others seek to circumvent the spiritual bonds and lingering shame of banishment. Whatever each entity's reason, Vashtor and his brokers are only glad to forge a binding contract. In exchange for an agreed price of mortal souls, reaped and offered up to the soul forges, the entity is fed into the machines and transformed into a grotesque melding of war machine and demon, such as a soul grinder, a calamity engine, or an infernal bombard. Other demons, less desperate or with less to offer the forges, are simply enslaved to Vashtor's will for a time, melding torturously with unholy machines and joining the ranks of his indentured hosts. Such demons' bonds are shown by a collar, manacle, ritual chain, or bodily mechanistic melding that becomes part of their manifest form while they remain indebted. Unlike other demons, it is not in Vashtor's nature to lie or trick. His contracts are explicit in their conditions. Instead, he leaves it to the monomaniacal nature of the demons themselves to entrap them in his service. For with every defeat, an indentured entity suffers, so its soul debt increases. Few indeed are the demons that have ever escaped their self-inflicted bondage. Meanwhile, the usefulness of the Forge's grotesque war engines to the demonic legions, coupled with the danger of being the only deity to lose Vashtor's allegiance, keeps the Dark God's reprisals at bay. He is the arms dealer of the great game, an agent of no single power, yet precariously allied to all. Quite aside from the infernal host he can summon to fight for him, Vashtor is himself a frighteningly powerful entity. Whether reordering the mechanisms of reality to his will, or soaring across the battlefields of real space amid storms of empiric lightning, the Archiphane is a demigod of dark artifice and technology. He is a demon of ordered and meticulous evil whose will is as inexorable as the churning gears of some great and unstoppable machine. End quote. But this is not where things end, for Vashtor has everything to do with the most central segment of this new lore, the Arcs of Omens. But what exactly is an Ark of Omens? Well, that is only understandable if one knows about Space Hulks. So, let us discuss them. What is a Space Hulk? Space is older than any of the gods, any of the races. The Milky Way galaxy is but one of many, and in all of that time, since the war in heaven, if not from even before that, there have been spacefaring races abroad the dark void of space. Crypts filled with ancient memories, ancient corpses, floating through space and time. Yet in the grim darkness of the far future, the warp is ever-present. 
Sometimes a ship or celestial body will be dragged through a breach in real space, and it will enter the warp. Most are torn apart or merely drift on their ethereal currents, but many are absorbed into what are called space hulks. Vast twisted shapes floating through space and the warp, conglomerations of many vessels from many places and times. They merge and are not just attached, but combined. One bleeding into the next, bleeding into the next, until they become a tortured yet unified whole. These things are space hulks. Some can be only a few ships, a mile or two in length, but the ones that truly count, and are then named and subsequently feared, can compromise hundreds of vessels. Can reach a hundred miles long, a good score across. Each of the ships can have different abilities, different weapons and defenses. Many are no longer active, or are warped so much they perform functions that none could ever guess at. Some are all but husks, with no real propulsion but their momentum. Nothing seems active until one is boarded. And space hulks can be cursed or infested in a thousand ways. In their dark, danker levels, they may have skittering gene stealers or their cults. In the core, they may have a chaos spawning bed of the Neverborn on their bridge. Might be anything imaginable from your worst nightmare, Xenos, stalking its decks. And each surface could be infested with genetically enhanced or ancient potent pathogens. Or worse, mystic strains from the Grandfather. They are both treasure troves of Archeotech, the genius of a myriad dead races, or ships of ancient providence from the Dark Age of Technology. But they are, more often... Death Incarnate. Within the bowels of these beasts are wonders and terrors that should, by rights, be left in the past. Some appear and herald times of mutation and rebellion, riots and savagery, before the doleful beast returns to the eddies of the warp, their merest presence emanating madness and hate for systems around. Some skim through realms without note, then are gone before any can react. Some are used as weapons or conveyances by the greenskins or migratory beings. But they are never, ever, welcomed in the Imperium, the Tau Empire, nor near the flight path of a craft world. When the Imperium must take one, must clear it, then it is to the power armoured that they turn, and only the best. And so it is that the Adeptus Sororitas, the Sisters of the Order's Militant, and the veterans of the Astartes, the Angels of Death, the Space Marines, who will then use tactical dreadnought armor or Terminator suits to you and I to even board such ships, let alone clear them. Entire chapters have been exterminated. Entire battle groups of the Imperial Navy have been swept away, all disappearing in the shadow of a space hulk. They are always a gamble unworthy of the taking, unless in dire need. The largest one could invade and scour its decks for a decade, and never even catch half of what may be lurking within. They are almost too vast for human conception. Mostly they are independent, or up until this point. The space hulks are like whales that traverse the universe, and none should get in their way. Yet all of that has now changed for Abaddon and Vashtor have weaponized these horrors. They make them into Arcs of Omens. The Arcs of Omens. Vashtor, the Archivane, is able to not only summon these beasts from the warp, but is able to dominate them, then enhance them. As a being of phenomenal power, he strikes them with lightning a physical manifestation of the energies he is forcing across the beasts. With hexes and wards cut or painted or burnt into the decks, the hull, the engines, he gains more control over the whole. Yet, not that which is inside. The creation of an Ark of Omens is time-consuming, yet the Archiphane quickly had a dozen for Abaddon's first wave. But what did Vashtor do 
to them? Let us find out. To quote, The Unhallowed Though each arc of omens was a distorted and anarchic nightmare each of its own, a handful of similarities distinguished them as being part of Abaddon and Vashtor's monstrous fleet. These coordinated adaptions and additions were intended to ensure that each arc would fulfill its role in advancing the prophecy above and beyond whatever its dire purpose its new masters might turn to it afterwards. The monstrous Unhallowed was amongst the first of the Arcs of Omens to be created and displayed all of these vital adaptions. Wardings To bind the Arcs of Omens and to prevent rebellion by the corrupted and vestigial machine spirits lingering within component craft, each was bound about with ritual wards. Some took the form of colossal runic inscriptions seared right into the hull plates or etched into countless passageways or bulkheads within. Others were immense runic chains, ritual altars or shrines erected throughout the craft, or even cages full of bound and blinded witches with their powers slave to the task in hand. Flesh Metal Gangliaxos each bolt of warp energy Vashtor sent coiling down to pierce the captive space hulk, transmogrified into swarms of silvery cyber nematodes. These in turn burrowed deep into the melding ships and systems that made up the hulk, exuding warp silicate strands behind them, and at times even stretching and braiding themselves into synapse-like flesh metal cabling. As these autocognitive pathways spread through the hulk, they connected and parasited any mechanical system still viable within a single command and control network. This was the Gangliaxos, whose root strands eventually converged within the designated control nexus of the newly fashioned Ark of Omen. The Warp Portal Every Ark of Omen incorporated a captive warp portal. Some were huge ritual circles conjoined within some cavernous hangar or cargo space aboard the Ark itself. Others were infernal maelstroms of energy or fanged and fleshy masses that churned behind or below the Ark. Sustained between towering iron veins or hovering rune-inscripted menhirs that crackled with unholy power. Few, besides Abaddon or Vashtor, knew the true purpose of these portals when the Ark set sail. The Obliskane Another infernal invention of the Archifane, and one of the greatest offerings to Abaddon, the Obliskane was an empiric beacon that burned like a raging bonfire in the warp. Generated by a freakish engine that melded flesh, iron and demonic essence, each Obliskane was powered by a warp furnace that in turn was fed with the souls of Psychers, a mockery of the Astronomicon not lost upon Abaddon. Though short-ranged, these devices transformed each arc into a highly visible waypoint amidst the maelstrom of the warp, allowing fleets of escorting warships to navigate by its presence and retain cohesion even while braving the raging warp storms of the Great Rift. Additional Systems As the Gangliaxos spread, it was typically able to reawaken some of the weapon systems, shields, communications arrays, and so forth, belonging to the vessels that made up the Space Hulk. Many of these were ancient or of esoteric alien design. Where they worked, they provided the vessel with all manner of bizarre and unexpected capabilities, temporal or probability-based weapon systems, neutron shielding, quantum communications, counter-ballistic teleportation batteries. All these and many more were rendered operable. Yet systems were also unreliable and sometimes widely scattered with swathes of blank or dead hull in between. To compensate for this, dark magi saturated weapons batteries, shield generators, vox arrays, even launch hangars and additional engineerums wherever they could be attached. Many of these installations were self-contained, generating their own air and power, and in no way conjoined with the often uncleared or hazardous spaces just feet away through the Ark's outer hull. The Ferryman 
No conventional ship's bridge could be employed to command so leviathan and unnatural a craft as a space hulk. Nor could any conventional cogitator array or mortal mind reliably pilot systems so distorted by long exposure to the warp. Instead, where the vessel's gangly axles converged, it melded with a demonic pilot entity called a ferryman. Grotesque meldings of iron and brass, gears and boilers and pistons, with twitching limbs, bulging eyes, and rippling warp-sensitive cilia, these entities served as both ship's bridge and crew. They were bound to obey the commands issued by the master of their Ark of Omen, though in truth their ultimate loyalty was to Vashtor before any mortal. End quote. Thus each Ark was granted to a volunteer, a supplicant to Abaddon, a warlord unto themselves. And each of these warlords, he asked but one thing. They were to go to one place first, to hit it, and take that which was secreted there. If this was done, the warlord could then keep the megalith of murder. From that point on, they could keep their Ark of Omen, and go where he or she wilt, to wage war on the worshippers of the corpse god even in their strongest places, for the power of an Ark was near unmatchable. Well, near they found out the hard way that, despite the size and unadulterated power of the Arks, they were not the ultimate weapon. Not nearly. For a move so bold, so loud, so brazen, could not be ignored. Even over the wrathful clash of the warp, the cries of worlds besieged or benighted by chaos invasion, the places consumed to a being by the Great Devourer. Even in this cacophony of pain and lamentation, the ripples from the arcs could be felt in the skeins of time and space and across the warp. Rebel bands attacked for the prize. The elder races that remained took to hunting the arcs. Eldar of nearly every path, place and loyalty joined in the hunt. The aspect warriors of the craft worlds coordinated through the players of Sagora, the Harlequins, with the denizens of the Dark City. Even the Eladrith in Nice, the Dukari, the Dark Elder, snuck onto arcs to cause pandemonium. The soulless legions of the Necrons would board any that pierced their domains and exterminate anything on board or die trying. Arcs slipped into real space to find themselves surrounded by high fleets of the Tyranids. The Orcs, predictably, saw them as huge targets and magnificent opportunities for a different locale and ambiance while fighting. Hence, any that were sent to orcish space were met with enthusiasm. The kin would fight them tooth and nail for every inch of space or land whenever the arcs appeared and disgorged their fanatical chaos worshippers. The tower would scramble their local fleets to intercept and attempt to blow them to pieces. Boarding was not often an option. Yet the power of the arcs the fleets of Chaos Renegade warships that surrounded them like shoals of fish. They were the equal of anything but a craft world or an Indomitus Crusade fleet. Few were stopped, and that was just in the first wave. For the twelve sent out were but the forerunners, the initial impact, all to gain the pieces of the key to fulfill the prophecy. And during all of this, the vengeful spirit one of the most lethal Gloriana-class warships ever built, one of the most powerful vessels in the galaxy, is now repaired, now complete, now returned to its power of old. But how does this segment end, gentle listener? To quote, The fight for the Temple Ultima took almost another hour to conclude. Under Abaddon's leadership, Black Legion forces flowed in through the sundered ascensor's gate. Meanwhile, other lesser bands prevented loyalist reinforcements from breaking through via Mount Santic or fighting their way up the devoted stair from St. Tethusa's Vale. Reports flickered through Abaddon's vox as he fought, his lieutenants reporting their successes to him as a battle for Chiron Tertius played out. Orbital dominance had been achieved, 
the last of the Loyalist defence monitors tumbling away into the planet's atmosphere on wings of fire. The Loyalist armour pushed along the penitent's pass had been blunted by an onslaught of mongrel possessed before blasting charges brought the mountainside down to block any further assaults. The Tempesta Scions attempting to counter-assault via the peak of Mount Imperator had landed only a handful of squads before flocks of Heldrakes tore their drop craft from the skies. It was that surviving handful of Imperial troops who provided the final line of resistance to Abaddon's assault. As he strode up the sweeping golden marble steps that led to the shrine of the God Emperor, it was their disciplined fire that greeted him. Lazfar seared the air, bolt shells slammed into carapace armored bodies, plasma blasts detonated like miniature suns. The scions were well dug in behind marble balustrades and onyx statues at the head of the stairs. Already, the bodies of several legionnaires sprawled upon the steps, their missing heads and melted chest plates testament to the ferocity of the loyalist firepower. Abaddon activated his vox even as he stepped over the dead and blasted a scion from his feet with a volley of bolts. Now, he commanded. The air crackled, corpus and crawled across the bodies of the dead. Scions span, giving cries of alarm as columns of infernal energy erupted around them. Hulking forms resolved as the teleport flares died away. Flesh metal slithered and contorted as the newly materialized obliterators leveled their guns and opened fire at point-blank range. Forward to victory, roared Abaddon, as a storm of flame and plasma engulfed the scions. He pounded up the steps at the head of his warriors. Draknian drank deep of loyalist blood. The scions' commanding officer died with Abaddon's talon rammed through his chest. The towering doors of the shrine of the god emperor crashed down in flames, the priceless images painted across them in lost millennia, bubbling and peeling to ash. Abaddon marched through the fire, with his warriors at his heels. The magnificence of the shrine was utterly lost on him. He cared nothing for the soaring pillars and arches, the artfully carved skylights, or the many hued braids of prayer banners that crisscrossed the vaulted ceiling. His eyes roved across, but did not see the serene beauty of the ancient shrine as he sought a sight of his prize. Bring up the witches, he ordered. Moments passed as he stood waiting, crimson light dancing in the skylights as the bombardment from on high continued. Distantly, Abaddon heard the roar of battle still being fought, last desperate attempts by the loyalists to prevent his victory. Too slow. Too late, he murmured. So predictable. Insectile clicking and the rasp of ragged breath announced the arrival of the slave psychers. Abaddon turned to see that it was Zorphus himself who had brought them, a pack of three barely human symbiotes, straining at leashes of chain and flayed skin. Find it, said Abaddon. Without delay, Lord Warmaster, replied Zorphus, making a show of releasing the slave psychers from their tethers. Ignoring the gaudy relinquery, illuminated by hundreds of candles at the shrine's heart, the twisted witches instead shambled across to one of the stone pillars near the eastern edge. There they hunched, the moistened antennae of their demonic helms twitching with febrile excitement. A blow from Draknien was sufficient, the false facing collapsed in a shower of age-old plaster. Revealed behind, nestled within the hollow pillar, was a marble plinth that Abaddon guessed had last seen daylight millennia before. Atop it sat a simple stone chalice, dusty with age. The bas-relief carvings that wound about it might have been blades or spears, or perhaps even much eroded representations of trees. That is what we seek. So mean a trifle, observed Zorphus. And yet, it is by such mean trifles that the Imperium of Mankind shall finally be laid low, said Abaddon, 
as he felt a presentiment of triumph burn within his hearts. End quote. We shall hear the continuation of this tale very soon, in Ox of Omens, Angron. But things are now dire enough, even without the return of the Red Angel. For Abaddon the Despoiler is now hailed as the War Master of the Imperium Nihilus. He has his Ox of Omens and the chaos that they spread. He has the sword Drachnien, and now he has the vengeful spirit in all its dark majesty. Abaddon is yet to receive more power, should he succeed in his venture with Vashtor. And no matter what happens, it will change the Imperium forever. I have been Baldabot, your faithful servant. Now subscribe and like and all that stuff if you enjoyed the video. And join me every Friday as I take dives into the Warhammer universe. Or check out one of our other channels on natural history and mythology. Links in the video description. Patron merch notification button. You know the boogaloo. Until then. No matter what you do today. Do try to make some time for fun. Too long.